And so I'm looking forward to talking about this morning, I'm going to talk to you about what to do when there seems to be no way out from Exodus in chapter 14. I touched on that really lightly Tuesday night, but I've got some more, more for you uh, this morning on that. But we're going to be covering things like, what do you do uh, when you want to hurt someone? <laughs> no, seriously. What do you do when you want to hurt someone? What do you do uh, when you've received the Judas kiss? What do you do on the worst day of your life? What do you do when you're just not feeling it? A lot of people still kind of bound by their feelings. Well, I can't forgive someone until I feel it. Uh, You've got to forgive before you feel it, and then you can feel it. But we'll talk about that. What do you do when life doesn't play fair? Are some of the subjects we're going to be dealing with, and we're just going to be dealing with them in a, in a service, one service like this. Uh, and what I intend to do, what my assignment includes, is that each one of these subjects will be covered more in depth. I'm going to write a booklet on each one of these and so by the time we're through with this assignment on Sundays we'll have a series of booklets in greater detail that we'll also be making available to those who want it so I want to jump into this this morning given the time we have remaining today again I'll be just touching it's not my intention to go into great great detail uh, concerning any of these what to do questions but I do want to point you uh, some uh, directions and sort of give you some things you can so I call them signposts to success kind of borrowing that from a man by the name of E.W. Kenyon who wrote a little book by that title but these are signposts to success they're just meant to point you a direction and if you'll head that direction with your life begin to open up your heart to God then you'll come away with the help that you need So let's look at these verses uh, from Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. It says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he shall show to you today. For the Egyptians, whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Again, we're talking about what to do when there doesn't seem to be a way, way out. Now, most of us in this room have never been in a situation like, quite like this one. But I'm thinking today about, you know, people who are in, in, in nations who are uh, being oppressed by their government, and they're seeking a way out, and uh, they're not finding a way out. Many nations are even slower today than ever before to receive refugees from another nation into their, uh, across borders and into their nation. And so literally there just doesn't seem to be help when people need help given that kind of situation. But I'm also thinking about people who have fought, just fought through, say, cancer, a horrible disease. And they beat cancer and cancer went into remission, but now it's come back at them. And now, you know, they've been through all of these treatments, but now the doctors are saying, you know, we've done everything we can do, and there's just no more we can do. So from behind, they're being chased by the recurrence of cancer, and in front of them, there are these barriers. Uh, People have reached their limits. The human element certainly have reached their limits, and there's just nowhere for them to go and nowhere for them to turn. So these situations, even though we may not be able to Uh, duplicate the exact circumstances that the children of Israel found themselves in. There are certain situations that we're facing in our day uh, that these truths that they were taught can apply to to us and and we can get much needed help because with God, come on, help me, all things. Say it out loud, with God, all things are possible. And they're possible to those of us who who just simply believe. So I'm going to run down through these. There's about six quick uh, touch points I want to to leave with you uh, today. Again, we'll deal with them in greater detail in another form. But but the first is just don't be afraid. You notice what he said there in verse 13. The first thing he said was fear not. Fear not is a phrase that appears in our Bible about 83 times, Old and New Testament, the exact phrase. The subject of fear is dealt with. Many, many more times than there, but not surprisingly, the first thing Moses does, he turns to the children of Israel who are really understandably upset. They thought they were free. They thought they had been set free. They thought they were going to get to go and 
begin to experience the promises of God fulfilled in their life, only to get to a place called the Red Sea and, uh, you know, and then hear from behind, uh, first hear and then see that they're being, again, pursued by their uh, masters, their former masters, by Pharaoh and all his, all his armies. And so, they, again, terror doesn't seem to describe what they must have been feeling in their heart. They were turning against God. They were crying out to God. And crying out to God doesn't indicate that they were just asking God's help. They were saying things to God and about God that they shouldn't have been saying. They did the same thing with their leadership in their fear. They began to turn against Moses and say, why did you just leave us in Egypt you know, and we could have been buried there and it, because we don't, now, now, now it looks like we're going to be buried somewhere else. We could have just been buried there. We didn't have to do all of this. And so they were sore afraid, the Bible says, and in great terror. And so the first thing Moses says, I believe by God's spirit, is don't be afraid. Let's say it out loud, don't be afraid. Now you say, well, that's easy for you to say Moses, but Moses was in the same set of circumstances that the children of Israel found themselves in that day. It's clear that what was happening on the inside of Moses was not yet happening on the inside of the people that he was leading. His what well, insight, what was work at work on the inside of him, maybe his own confidence or trust, was certainly at a different place than what was in the children of Israel. And let me just back up and say that in this in this scenario we have we have all elements. We have the human element, we have the divine element, and we have natural, the natural to deal with. The Red Sea was not uh, demonic. It wasn't suddenly placed there by demon spirits to keep the children of Israel from advancing. It was just there. It's part of the terrain. Come on, there are things in life. God's not behind it. The devil's not behind it. It's just terrain. It's, it's tough. And we get to it, and we find it impossible to deal with or to cross or to handle. And so we have all of these beautiful elements, educational elements in this one tremendous story that has a really good ending for the children of Israel. And so the first thing, again, Moses deals with here is fear by God's Spirit. And let me just say this to you about fear if you don't know it. If, if we don't handle uh, in the Spirit, if we don't handle fear, if we don't handle the Spirit of fear, it's almost always a precursor to defeat. We will make some of our worst decisions under the influence of fear when we're afraid. And thank God for his help. Can, can, can I have an amen there? Thank God for his help. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but what? Power, love, and soundness of mind. In fact, the Bible says that perfect love, God is perfect love, cast out all fear. But I don't think that Moses here was trying to what, give a lesson on the love of God, given these circumstances, and again with Pharaoh and the armies of Pharaoh in hot pursuit. I think what Moses was trying to do here was to get the people to again just trust in God. He wanted them to remember. Everybody say remember. He wanted them in this moment to remember, to keep in mind what had already happened, what God had already done. That helps me. That speaks to me. I don't have to know everything in my Bible, every verse in my Bible concerning fear or even the love of God when I'm in trouble. I just need to remember what God has already done for me. Amen. Has God ever done anything for any of us in the room here today? Amen. We just need to remember, and we've talked about the power of remembrance. We've talked about how it makes something in the past fresh today. We, we're going to do that at the close of service again today. We're going to remember the Lord's death by receiving communion at his table. And what we're really doing in one aspect is we're taking what happened 2,000 years ago and we're making it real this Sunday. We're, freshing, we're, bring, we're making it fresh in our own thinking, in our own mind, and we're being helped by it. So we want to remember, Moses was saying, remember what God has already done. God had already shown how powerful he was, how determined he was, how willing he was to get his people free. Now, why would God change his mind now? I heard one theologian one time, he's a modernist, he said, you know, the Red Sea was only just like six, six inches deep at that time when the children of Israel crossed over. They literally just waded through the Red Sea. Well, that makes the, the drowning of Pharaoh and his armies even a greater miracle. They all drowned in six inches of water. 
God wants us to recall and wants us to remember. And the Holy Spirit, by the way, is always here to help us remember anything that God has spoken to us or anything that God has done for us. When you feel like you're up against it, you have nowhere to go, there's no way out. When everything screams at you, you're done. Remember that God is good and he's good all the time and he's made provision for you in the past. And the second thing, you got to choose to believe he'll do it again. And I think that's what Moses was trying to communicate to the children of Israel there is remember what God has done, what he's already done, and remember to believe that he will do it again. The next thing we find here is the phrase stand still. It's a couple of phrases like that in the scripture. One is here and the other is in Psalm 46 and verse 10 where the scripture says be still. And here the, the, it could have been better translated stand firm. What Moses was communicating, or God was communicating to Moses, Moses communicating to the people, was that they needed to stand firm. Of course, the urge when you're afraid or when you're under attack or when you're in a place where you're being terrorized is just to throw all reason aside and just run, panic. And, and what God is saying, again, through Moses to the people here, what God, I hope, is saying to us here today is you just stand firm. Don't be afraid. And stand firm. The word here actually means to take your position against all odds. It means to stand like someone who has faith in God. And there's also a part of it that says do it with somebody else. So in other words, Moses is saying to the people in this set of circumstances, you know, just stand firm. Stand in place. Stand against the odds. Stand like someone who believes in God, has faith in God. And stand with everybody else. Stand together against this. How many of you still believe we're better together than we are apart? Why do we believe that? Because the Bible teaches us that. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 13 and 14 say this, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. We have the word withstand again meaning to stand against we have the word stand twice, which means to abide, to continue, a military term in the Greek language, to actually stay your post or stay on the wall. And then he said, stand therefore. Having done all, to stand, stand therefore. And again, I mentioned in Psalm 46, two verses, verses 9 and 10, that the scripture says, God makes wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaks the bow, he cuts the spear asunder, he burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The word here stand is a little different. Uh, it's a different word in the Hebrew language. And it literally means to relax or slacken. And the idea is that we would stop trusting in ourself and, and instead turn our cares, our concerns over on God. Of course, in the New Testament, again, we know that. Peter wrote that in one of his letters. He said, cast the whole of your care over on God because he cares for you. There's a basis that empowers us, a truth, a revelation that empowers us to cast the whole of our care over on God. And that's just knowing that he cares for us. So Moses is saying, stand firm and stand in place, but also stand relaxed in your posture or trusting more in God then you would trust in yourself. Trust more, look more to God than you look to yourself. Be still and know that I'm God. I have the upper hand. I have you covered. I'm God. You don't have to be. Isn't that good? We don't have to be God in every situation. Besides that, we can't. On our best day, we can't be God anyway. So we might as well let God be who he is, and let's be who we are, his people. Amen. The third thing we find here is... Also in verse 13, Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. So the third point here is to expect God to deliver you. Actually anticipate that God will deliver you. God said again through Moses to the children of Israel, he said this, he said, I'm going to show you something, and I want you to see it. I want you to take note of it. I want you to behold it. I'm going to do something here. 
The Hebrew word means to do or make for you, to accomplish for you, to bestow on you, or to advance you into something. The word see, watch this, means to advise yourself or to closely consider. In other words, God said, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to do it. And I want you to advise yourself in this. I want you to talk to yourself a little bit about this and what you see. And I want you to closely pay attention to what I do. He said, I'm going to show you salvation. The word salvation comes from a well-known Hebrew word, Yeshua. Does that sound familiar to you? It's a word that actually means deliverance, help, victory, prosperity. The word Yeshua is applied to Jesus as uh, Messiah and Savior. And so he's saying, I'm going to show you deliverance. I'm going to give you help. I'm going to show you victory. And I'm going to help you gain prosperity. I'm going to do this for you. These two small words are used to inject a steadfast hope into the hearts of the people. Again, just walking with Jesus for as long as I have, I've come to know that every promise from God is meant to carry us into a glorious future that he has planned for us. Did you know that? Every promise, and God's got a promise, I think, for everything we deal with in life. But every promise that God has given us is meant to carry us into a glorious future or to usher us into a new and defined place in God. Come on, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I'm at a new place. You're at a new place as a believer. The Bible says over and over again, a number of different ways, without a vision or without hope, the people, they perish. They just wander. One translation says they live without restraint. Without a divine revelation of hope, my people perish. I think we underestimate the value of hope when we get into tough situations. And yet hope is powerful. It puts us in a powerful place place hope is a standard of strength even in the worst of times the next thing we see in scripture is that God gives perspective when we're up against the wall and we can't find our way out God adds perspective to our life Uh, again in verse 13 uh, the word says for the Egyptians whom you have seen today you shall see them again no more forever wow God wants us to see our enemies defeated amen he doesn't want us to to see them like they want to be seen he doesn't want us to see satan the way satan wants to be seen satan wants us to believe that he's somehow on an equal plane with god and that they're just really fighting it out and it's going to be down to the wire and in the end the referees are going to have to make the final call And we know in this room here today, can I have a good amen? We know that the devil has already been defeated. That Satan has already fired his greatest weapon and biggest weapon. And he has been completely defeated. And you and I need to begin to see that, if we're not already seeing it, and keep that in in our minds. They are already defeated. All right. God said, I'm going to take care of them today and you'll never see them again uh, ever. That had to bring hope, anticipation, courage to the lives of these people, and perspective. See yourself as God sees you. That's something else you have to have a perspective of. Again, you say, well, I'm not perfect. I'm not worthy. Well, get in line. If that's all God has to deal with, we're all, we're all in trouble. God knows that. He knows our frailty. But God is who he is. And he sees you a certain way. And you are a covenant people. Israel had a covenant with God. They had sinned mightily against God. They had murmured against God. They had sinned against God. They put in, in place of the almighty God a, a, a golden calf, cow, and worshipped it. And yet God, because he is faithful... To a thousand generations, he remained faithful even in their unbelief. And he just looked, you know, and he, he wants us to see that we're a covenant people in the new, new covenant. He wanted them to see that they were a covenant people under the old covenant. They had a covenant with God. They were covenant people. It's easy to see ourselves as grasshoppers and others as giants. But we are the people of God. We are washed in the blood of the Lamb. We are born of His Spirit. Amen. We have a covenant, an everlasting covenant with God. 
And so we can have a different perspective than we would otherwise. But I got this in Scripture. I want you to get it this morning if you don't get anything else. That we need to see our surroundings differently. That's what God wanted, again, through Moses, to get the people of Israel to see. He wanted to see their surroundings were different. I meditated this, and I, I thought, you know what? What are you trying to get over to me, God? And he said, he said, look at the Red Sea. In your mind's eye, just look at the Red Sea. So I tried to picture the Red Sea as best I could. And he said, do you see a way over? And I said, well, no, I'm kind of like the children of Israel. I don't see a way to cross. I, I would also be in a panic. He said, well, there was a bridge not over the water, but there was a bridge under the water. And that's sometimes how we look at our circumstances, especially when we're pinned. We don't see things clearly. We don't see things the way God would want us to see them. We don't know to consider that God has a way, even when there doesn't appear to be a way, that he wants to reveal to us. It's amazing that the bridge was down here underneath and not over the water. And all God had to do, and that's really the next point, all God had to do was just breathe on the Red Sea. And the waters parted and congealed on their right side and on their left side like jello would. And then the, the, the wet ground was dried out by his breath. And they could march to the other side on that earthen bridge by a provision that God made. I'm urging you today, if you're up against it, you know, again, even if the doctors have said, there's nothing else we can do, we're so sorry. You've got three months to live. I would just urge you to look for the bridge. Amen. I would urge you to ask God to show you that bridge. Amen. Because again, even what, when man can't do anything else, God can still do it. Number five, God is on your side. He's for you. He's greater than all. There are two thoughts there. God is on your side. Verse 14 says, the Lord will fight for you. If God is for you, who can be against you? The New Testament says. God is on our side, and he is greater than all. That word, that Hebrew word translated fight there actually means to consume. It means that God will, will eat up, devour up our enemies. Praise God. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. He's greater in every possible way. I love this. Psalm 37, 20 says it, but the wicked shall perish, but the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs and they shall consume into smoke. They shall consume away. And then Psalm 2, verses 2, 3, and 4 says this, the king of the earth, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Sit on it. Think about it. Why are you afraid? God is on your side. And God is greater than all. Amen? The word derision there means he'll have them stammering. Talking to themselves. Making no sense. Confused. Amen. Even, the, even in Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, the Bible says that the enemy will come out against you one way and he'll flee seven different ways. And that means he's confused. He's lost his way. Now he is weakened. He has divided himself. He came to conquer, but he is cast away as the one conquered. Amen. And finally, number six, Moses says to the people of God, he says, hold your peace. Hold your peace. He says, the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. I believe this is a powerful word of instruction for any of us again today who just don't know what to do and we're up against it in our situation the Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace in other words the word peace here means to be quiet or to leave off speaking to be quiet or to leave off speaking when we're surrounded by unbelievable circumstances we should especially watch what we say there's a time to govern our tongues so that our situations can be well governed in a panic, we usually say way too much of the wrong thing. And even when it's time to move forward, 
or advance, we find ourselves snared by the words of our mouth. Because our words go out from our heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, Jesus said, the mouth, that's what it speaks. Our words go out. Also, the Proverbs chapter 6 says we are snared by the words of our mouth. We're taken captive by the words of our lips. And so our words that we're speaking are going out ahead of us, and they're waiting for us to meet them somewhere out into the future. That's why we always want to be speaking things that we don't mind being caught up in or caught by. Good things. Amen? A lot of us make situations that are already difficult much worse by the things we say after, that it, after it's occurred. We make a way back that's already somewhat difficult much, much harder because of the things we say behind the scenes, the horrible things that we say about God, about one another. We say all the wrong things, and we want to get back. We want to come back. We want to get into a place of peace and victory. Now we've got to walk through rubble that we've created on top of everything else by the things that we've said with our mouth. No wonder God just said, watch this. I'm going to fight for you, and I want you to shh, shh. Be quiet, because I'm going to do something, and I want, you to, I want you to take it in. I want you to be a part of it. Amen? So those six things, just in words of wisdom today, look at them again. If you don't have them written down, they're right here on the screen for you before we, we stop. Number one, don't be afraid. Say it out loud. Don't be afraid. Number two. Just stand still. What does that mean again? Stand firm. Or it also means stand, casting our care over on God, trusting God, not trusting in ourself. Number three, expect God to deliver you. Let God put hope on the inside of you concerning your future. Number four, get God's perspective on your enemies, on who you are in God, in Christ as a Christian, and certainly concerning your circumstances. Number five, remember that God is on your side. He's actually behind you. Again, if God is for us, we should be for each other. We should be for us. We should be for each other. Number six, hold your peace. Watch your tongue. Watch what you say. So if I just think that if God gave these six truths to the children of Israel that day, given their circumstances, and, and I, I can't imagine their circumstances being in their circumstance. I can't. But if these would work for them in those circumstances, how many of you think they might work for you given what you're up against today? Whatever they are, whatever your circumstances are. It's the wisdom of God, and it'll make a difference in your life. Amen?